hallelujah to the Lamb. His name is King Jesus. And he reigns. Thank God he reigns. Thank God the president doesn't reign. Thank God the governor doesn't reign. Thank God that Jesus reigns forever. He reigns forever and forevermore. I thank God that Jesus still reigns. He, he reigns forevermore. He reigns. We ought to cry out sometimes, all oh, hail King Jesus. All oh, hail King Jesus. He reigns for, forevermore. And that's hell, H-A-I-L. All oh, hail King Jesus. He reigns. You just want to be clear on Sunday morning. All oh, hail H-A-I-L. He reigns for, forevermore. He there's none like him. He reigns forever. Thank God for Jesus. He is the one who reigns. Going through what you go through, he reigns. He is our power. He is our strength. He is our God. He reigns forever. He reigns forever. Hallelujah to the reign. Thank God for Jesus. He is. I said, thank God for Jesus. He is, he is Lord. He is God. I thank God for who he is and what he has already done. He is the matchless Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Let me call your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The book is 2 Corinthians in the New Testament. The chapter is 5. The verses are 20 and 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. And Jesus reigned. I thank God that he reigns. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. If you're not too mean and too stubborn, would you please stand for the reading of the word? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. When you found it, you will discover these words. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God even pleading through us, as though God is pleading through us, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I want to talk about the resume of the church. The resume of the church. Whenever you go on a job interview, you're going to need a resume. Anytime, anytime you, you go looking for employment, even if you send a letter, even if you have, have uh, filled out the application, you need a resume. You need something that will tell people three things. Number one, who you are. Number two, what you do. And number three, why you do it. Your resume describes to people what you've been through and how you handled what you've been through. And it tells the people how long you've been there and, and how you left there and why you left there the way you left there. The sad summation today, many folk leave jobs in the wrong way. I mean, there's nothing good about it. It's just wrong. You know, the going thing is to make sure you give a two weeks notice. But because they made me mad, I, I just quit on the spot. Your resume tells them whether you were satisfied when you were there or not. How do you know that, preacher? Because your resume tells people that, uh, that when they look at your resume, it tells them whether you had passion while you were there. The sad summation today is when we look at the church resume, 
We have to try to figure out if you have passion about the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at your personal resume, can we see that, that you love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind? When we look at your personal resume, can we look at your resume and determine whether you love other folk like you love yourself? If we were to pull up your resume and what you've done in your life in the past and what you're doing in your life in the present, will we be able to come to the conclusion that you are a Christ? That you are Christ-like and you love Jesus the Christ operating in your life? The question this morning is, when they come to your funeral, will they be able to tell the truth or lie for you? Because when you're living, folk will lie on you. When you die, folk will lie for you. Will they say that he was there and he did these things and he did them well and he did it with love and compassion? Will they say that he always had a smile on his face regardless of what he or she were going through? Or will they say that you could tell written all over their face whenever they were going through something? Because those who walk in Christ, those who love Jesus Christ, they have grown to the point where they can handle things that they couldn't handle six months ago. Do you get shaken up over every little thing? Do you, do you just quit when, when, whenever things going wrong in your life? Do you just give up and throw in the towel? What's on your resume this morning? Paul begins this chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with a famous uh, message that we oftentimes hear at funerals. He talks about that one of these days we're going to take off this old man. He, he says, for, for we have a earthly, when this earthly tabernacle that we have down here is one day dissolved. Let me tell you, regardless of what you're living in, regardless of what you're shaped like, regardless of what you're built like, one of these days, <laughs> you're going to get out of here. Matter of fact, it doesn't matter how fine you are, it doesn't matter how well you're built, your earthly tabernacle is dissolving every day. We spend our time at the gym, we spend our time eating right, but I want to serve notice on you this morning that your earthly tabernacle is dissolving down here. Paul says this tabernacle is nothing but a tent. And one of these days, this tent is going to go away. You see, a tent has a problem in the fact that whenever the wind blows, the tent responds. Whenever it rains, water gets in the tent. Whenever it's cold, it's cold in the tent. These bodies, these physical specimens that we have, they are dissolving down here. And because these bodies are dissolving down here, we need to make sure we have a promise and the fact that we have another building that's not made by hand. Paul declares we got another building. It's, it's, it's this building is being destroyed every day. It's being put in turmoil every day. It has ulcer in it and it has fritters in it. It has high blood pressure, low blood pressure, and when you're dead you have no blood pressure. This building is dissolving down here. But Paul says that we have a guarantee, we have a down payment, and you ought to be making your down payment on a brand new building. The way you live your life, the way you commit to Christ is a down payment. The folk back home would say it like this, I'm sending up my timber every day. What they were saying is, I'm preparing for my new building. If my children are not preparing, I'm preparing for my new building. If, if my friends are not comparing, I'm, I'm preparing for my new building. Yeah, yeah. Paul declares we have the guarantee, and this guarantee is in Jesus Christ. He's saying to us that one of these days we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we will have to give account of every deed that has been done in this life. We would have to give account of every thought and how we dealt with that thought. We have to give account of everything that's around us and how we handle those things that are around us. Did we blow up on the middle of every little situation that came up? Or were we smooth, calm, and collective in our coolness? 
Because when you walk in faith for Jesus Christ, you don't get upset over every little thing. And every little thing is not a shut your mouth with you. When, when you when everything shows up, you're not you're not bent out of shape over every little thing because you know that uh, this present day suffering is not to be compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed in Christ Jesus. You already know that when you walk in Christ, you understand that, that he's walking with you and he has your best interest at heart. Paul says that the church, the church of Jesus Christ ought to have a resume. And the resume ought to tell who we are. It ought to tell what we do. And it ought to tell why we do it. He says to us, as born again believers in Jesus Christ, we need to understand that we are called to be ambassadors for Christ. We are called. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. You see, the ambassador to the UN, the ambassador of the United States to the UN, he has a direct line that goes straight to the White House. And in the moment that something goes wrong, all he has to do is pick up the hotline. And he doesn't have to dial any numbers. He doesn't have to dial anything. He doesn't have to punch in any digits. He just picks up the phone. Because he is the ambassador. He is the one who represents. He is the one who takes care of business on foreign soil. Yeah, yeah. I want to tell you this morning, we are on foreign soil. Amen. This is not our home. We don't belong here. If we're saved, if we're born again, we are just pilgrims passing through. And because we are pilgrims passing through, don't get too comfortable down here. Yeah. We ought to wear this world like a loose garment where we can take it off and put it on at any given time. And see, if God calls me home right now, I have a prepared heart and I have a prepared place on the other side. A little boy was sitting in school and the teacher asked a question to about 35 students. And the teacher wanted to know how many people in here want to go to heaven. 34 students raised their hand. Said, little Johnny, you know, we always call him Johnny when we don't know his name. Said, little Johnny, little Johnny, why didn't you raise your hand? Don't you want to go to heaven? He said, yeah, teacher, I want to go, but I thought you was getting a bus load right now, and I ain't ready to go yet. <laughs> That's how some Christians in church are. We, we're not prepared to go to a prepared place that's been prepared for a prepared group of people. If you are Christ, if you are an ambassador, meaning that you are to represent Jesus the Christ. In a few days, we will be celebrating 20, 25 years of the New Beginning Church. Amen. What will our resume say? Will our resume that says that we just met on Sunday, spent time watching our clocks, doing nothing for the Lord, but just sitting there and waiting? Did we just show up to check the box and make sure that we can say we showed up at church today? Will our resume say that we got in tune with the service and we came to watch him move and not watch them? Will our resume say that, that we just showed up in, in the midst of a fashion show to see who was wearing what and to see what we could wear? Will our resume say that we showed up and we brought praise in the building and we weren't waiting on the praise team to pump us up to get into praise? The psalmist says in Psalm 100 that we ought to get out the car. We ought to get off the buggy. We ought to walk down the street before we get in the courtyard. We ought to have praise and thanksgiving on our hearts. We ought to come into the door praising him. We ought to show up worshiping him. We ought to show up blessing his holy name. Because we know who we are. In order to be an ambassador, you have to go through some things. You have to be changed. You just don't show up as an ambassador. You just don't walk in as an ambassador. You see, the world has it right and the church has it wrong. You see, the church have come to the conclusion that we can just let anybody show up, anybody get in ministry, anybody just be a part of ministry, anybody just do whatever they want to do in ministry and walk out the door and say, the Lord knows my heart. You right, he knows your heart. We have to get to a point where we have to go through some things. And, and our youth and our young people have become small because they haven't gone through anything. 
we make statements, I don't want our children to grow up the way I grew up. I don't want them to have to go through what I've been through. But if they don't go through anything, they'll think somebody owes them everything. If they don't spend time having to wrestle with some things, they will come to the conclusion that everything belongs to them and everybody ought to give to me and I don't have to work for anything. Well, yesterday I, I watched the special of the Carter football players in Dallas, Texas. And these boys went to the championship one year and then the next year, they won the championship. This little small, small town was high on these football stars. Many stars, more than ever recorded in history, got contracts written and signed with colleges. But after the season was over, they found themselves watching other folk and other boys. And they saw these boys showing up with gold chains and they saw them riding in high expensive cars and they began to want to be like those little boys. Yeah, yeah. These boys are only 16 and 17 years old at the time and, and they began to rob one place after the other because they wanted the money that they saw other folk get. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, young folk, if it doesn't belong to you, leave it alone. If, if, if you can't buy it, you don't need it. So these famous athletes that, that the whole city is high on, they begin, nine of them begin to rob one place after the other. And let me just say this to you. Don't think that if Bunny and Clyde got caught, you ain't going to get caught. It has been said that these young men robbed more places than Bunny and Clyde did. And one of them was a preacher's boy. Uh -oh. And now they messed up their career in college and, and messed up their career in pro. Yeah. And now they're sitting, and that time they were sitting in prison. Some of them got, got seven years. Some of them got 14 years. They're sitting in prison watching their classmates that played on the same team with them yeah. run the ball in the NFL, tackle in the NFL. And they said even when it got to court, they didn't realize how serious it was. They didn't realize that putting guns in people's faces and, and taking thousands and thousands of dollars, they didn't realize how serious it was. But one of the athletes said, when, when the judge started reading off the sentences, <laughs> and he read off 14 years, he said he realized then that he had messed up. What has happened to the world in which we live where we messed up and don't realize we messed up? What has happened when people who have spent time doing great things in their lives and they made great accomplishments, and then they don't realize when they're messing up? What has happened when, when we spend our time giving our children all that we have to give them and then we get to a point where our children is not appreciating what we have to give? Don't you know that it takes a lifetime to build a great reputation? It takes a matter of a split second to tear that reputation down. Where is the church? In all this, the Bible says, Paul says that, that we are called to be ambassadors. We are called to be the go-between. We are called to, to intercede between God and the people that's going through things. We are ambassadors for Christ. You see, the church belongs to Christ. It, it doesn't belong to the pastor. And it certainly doesn't, doesn't belong to the deacons. And it doesn't belong to the people Christ is the owner. Christ is the one that died for the church. Yes, sir. The church belonged to the one who hung over 2,000 years ago. The one who gave his very life for it. The church belongs to him. The church, the, the, the bride of Christ. You see, some say that, that, that the preacher is the groom, but I come to tell you that, that, that Christ is the only groom that fit for the church. Because the preacher never died for the church. The, the preacher didn't take any latches for the church. It is the church that, that belongs to Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. And, and we need to make sure, and we need to make sure that we call men to God, to the great deity, the supreme one. We need to make sure that we, we are employing people to come to Jesus. We are pleading. God is pleading with us. God is asking us that the church be the church. That the church be the one that stands in the midst of all that we have problems with. And, and because medication is not fixing it, doctors don't know what they're doing. And psychologists are all off the rack. Every child that acts out doesn't need medication to slow him or her down. We need Jesus and Jesus alone. The church, who are we? We are ambassadors. We are called. We are called to get folk to Christ. We are called to get men to Christ. We have to stop riding the church on our own. We got to get somebody else impacted. We, we got to stop pleading the fifth when we hang around folk that are doing the wrong thing. We got to call men to Christ, to Jesus, to Christ. We are called. We are employed by Christ. We are called by Christ. We, we, are, ministered. we are ministers for Christ. This word pleading means that we are, we are beseeching men. We, we, are, we are even begging and entreating men. We, we are inviting men. We are calling men near unto God. We are, we are calling men unto God in such a way that we know the end is a dreadful end. We are calling men to Christ in such a way that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if they don't come to Christ, their end will be terrible. We are employed by Christ, and we are employed to call others to Christ. Who are we? We are the church. Who are we? We are born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Who are we? We are the one who, who trusts the story that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. We, we are those who are different. We are those who believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. We, we believe that without him we can't get to the Father. We, we believe that he's the great shepherd. We, we believe he's the door to the sheepfold. We are the church. Too many times we thought that the church was the brick, the mortar, and the sheep rock. Yeah, that's the place called church. It is the location called church. It, it is the building that we go to to meet with God as others meet with God. I hear you. I, I understand what you're saying. You're saying, but preacher, I don't have to go to church because the church is in me. You're right. But you have to do something with Hebrews chapter 10 where it says, don't forsake the assembly of yourself together. You got to come together with brothers and sisters of your like kind. You, you ought to run to the church. A few years ago in Cincinnati, there was a concert going on. The concert was going on with, with a band called the Who Band. The Who Band, a fire broke out in the midst of the club, and people ran and stampeded each other. Many folk died because they were looking to see the Who Band. That night, that, that night, that night, I began to wonder how many will flock the church on Sunday morning. How many will pack it out so much until we have to stampede each other in order to get out the day? I'll go, I'm looking for the day when we flock the church and go to the church of the God Jesus Christ and go to it and flock and pack it out. Looking forward to the day. And I'm not talking about when 9-11 happened. When 9-11 took place, folks that hadn't been to church in months of Sunday, they showed up at the church. On a Tuesday night, I couldn't even get in the building. On a Tuesday night, I couldn't kneel down in prayer because it was full of folk taking off work to come to the church. Well, about two weeks later, it went back to normal. About two weeks later, we, we sit up and we can throw a rock and hit anybody. Because we don't have the respect that we ought to have for the church. We don't have the commitment we ought to have to the church. And secondly, the church is the atmosphere. It is the enjoyment. It is spending time with the Lord. It is that moment when you leave out the door and say, we sure enough had some church today. 
It is the atmosphere, the excitement, the passion that, that we get involved with God and God gets involved with us. He meets us at the church and we leave the church having had some church. It is the atmosphere called church. I'm not talking about putting on a show. I'm, I'm not talking about doing what you do. I'm not talking about your program and falling into a tea. I'm talking about when the Lord God himself reveals himself in the midst of the service. You see, we don't have to pray, Lord, come in the building. He was at the building before we showed up here. We don't have to pray, Lord, come in and, and have your way because God is a sovereign God. He, he has his way anytime he gets ready. We just have to yield ourselves in the service. I think. He's the sovereign God. He does what he wants to do. When he chooses to do it. Any way he chooses to do it. Anyhow and with whoever he chooses to do it. Because he's a sovereign God. And he doesn't have to be welcome in the building. We got to be welcoming him in our building. Simply because he is an omnipotent God, he is an all-powerful God, and he's an omnipresent God. He's everywhere at the same time. Wherever God turns, God bumps into himself because he's an omnipresent God. We ought to be crying for, for people that are going through hardships that we see that they're on their way to hell. We won't even talk to our children about Jesus. We won't talk to our co-workers about Jesus. We won't talk to our neighbors about Jesus. We ought to stop somebody dead in their tracks at least once or twice a day and ask them about the story of Jesus Christ. He says we are ambassadors, and the ambassador is always on his job. When he go home, he's still the ambassador. When he spend time with his friends, he's still the ambassador. And the ambassador always delivers the goods and delivers the message of the country in which he's from. We're not from this country. We are, we are from a heavenly place, and we ought to always deliver the message to men and women so they can go to our home place. He says we, we are implored to call men to Christ on behalf of Jesus Christ, not only that, that, that they can be reconciled unto him, but also that they can be changed unto him. This word reconciliation, it, it simply means that we ought to ask people to return back to God, return back to the favor of God, and change in the midst of your return, and be reset and renewed because of God. You see, God, God had Adam just where Adam needed to be, but Adam decided to use his brain. And many times we as Christ have decided to use our brain rather than trust in God. It is our responsibility to call men to favor in God. You need to let them know if you're going to have real favor, you're going to have it through Jesus Christ. There is nothing in nobody else that you can have favor through other than Jesus Christ. We are called to reconcile men back to Christ. We are, we, are called, we are called to make sure that men repent back to Jesus Christ. We are called that men will turn from their evil ways. But we've got to be the church that will repeat over and over again the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't tell them about Jet Magazine and expect them to come to Christ. We can't tell them about Ebony and expect them to come to Christ. We can't talk about Vogue and how well folk are dressed and expect them to come to Christ. We can't go and get internet sermons and, and tell them to come to Christ. We just need to deliver the gospel message that was given to us from our home state. Reconcile. Be reconciled unto God. Be changed unto God. For, for he has made us, made him that did no sin to be sin on our behalf. Jesus the Christ had no sin, was not guilty of sin, but he was made sin by God to be, be sin for us and on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And if we don't find ourselves in him, then we are not the righteousness of God. You see, we our sin nature love to sin. Yeah, yeah. We like sin. You put some Frank and Beverly and Mays on right now, I, it, 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 it just turns something in my mind right away. And for some of the women in this room, if, if Barry White would just speak just a little while, and they begin to have all kinds of thoughts again. If Teddy B Pentagram would say, turn off the light, and somebody begin to reflect when the lights were turned off. It's because we have a sin nature. And we love spending our time in sin. 
our young generation that just love Beyonce and, and Bruno Mars, and they, they just really like to be, be engaged and in tune with them. But if, if you don't put first things first, then last things will get you in trouble. Yeah, yeah. You got to be able to put first things first. When you put the Lord first, Denzel Washington would tell you, if you want to do what I have done, you need to do what I am doing. What he said is, I've always kept God first. And if you keep God first, then God can help you with your dream. God can help you with your motivation. And God can help you with your passion. Denzel Washington says this. Just put God first. He says, when you take off your shoes at night, put them way up on the bed. So when you put them way on the bed while you're down there on your knees, you can talk to God about it. And then he says, when you reach under the bed in the morning to get your shoes, you got to get down on your knees in order to reach under there and get your shoes. So while you're down there, you ought to talk to God. But see, some smart folk will say it like this. I don't get on my knees to get my shoes out from under there. I lay flat down. Let me tell you something. It was, it was revealed in the Sunday school lesson this morning. You ought to lay prostrate every now and then. Lay down before God. And while you're laying down before, the, before him, you ought to always talk to him and allow him to talk to you. We are ambassadors. The church, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. That's who we are. We compel men to come to Christ. That's what we do. And let me tell you why we do it. We do it because Jesus the Christ took on sin. Yes, sir. When he had no sin, he, he took on sin. When, when he was not sin, Jesus Christ took my sin and he, he took your sin and he died for you over 2,000 years ago. Jesus the Christ himself, he died on a skull hill called Calvary. That's why we do it. We do it because we were on our way to hell. We wasn't fit to live. We were too mean to die. We had no control over our life. But Jesus died for us over 2,000 years ago. They hung him high. They dropped him low. They raised him high. I'm telling you, they killed my Lord and my God. He died on the skull hill called Calvary. He died, I tell you. He died on the skull hill. They took him off the cross, laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because he didn't need it too long. Out of that Thursday morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. That's why we do it. That's why we're the church. We're the church to call me into Christ. Remind them what Jesus has already done and tell them that if you just believe the story, he can change your life today. Jesus of Christ died for us. Yeah. He became sin for us. He died on a skull hill called Calvary for us. But the good news is he didn't stay dead. There came a woman in the grave. Death couldn't hold him and the grave couldn't keep him. Right in that Thursday morning, he got up with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. And it's just this little story that we need to tell people about because we need to tell them as you take on this story, as you trust in this story, you can be born again. You can be saved right here today just like you are. The piano doesn't have to play. The drums don't have to be. You don't have to hear the good talk. But what you must do is repent and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. It's just that simple. You just trust the story. Trust the story that Jesus died. Trust the story that he was buried. Trust the story that he was rose on the third day morning. He got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. And if you can just believe the story, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. If you can just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried in the bar too. He rose from the dead. If you can just believe the story that, that Jesus Christ, who was no sin, who had no sin, who participated in no sin, he took on our behalf. He took sin on. And because he took sin on our behalf, and now I'm free. I'm changed now. I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank God for Jesus. I was on my way to hell. I was out of here. But Jesus rescued me and made me over and over again. And now I've been reconciled to Christ. Will you be reconciled to Christ? The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. You ought to come to him trusting that he died for your sin. 
that he took on sin on your behalf. This is the resume of the church. The church of Jesus Christ ought to tell men, women, boys, and girls that we are ambassadors for Christ. And we've been implored. We've been compelled. We've been changed, and we want other folks to be changed in him. And if you can just believe the story, you can go to heaven when you die. I told you earlier that this tent that we in is changing down here. It's changing down here. I, I used to lift a few pounds, run a few miles, and, and all of a sudden, because I was a young man, everything began to harden up around me. Now I can't run a few miles and things harder up. I, I, I can't lift a few weights. I got, I got a triple double, sometimes 10 quarter more than what I used to do. It's because my tent is breaking down. I can't do what I used to do because my tent is dissolving down here. But I got good news. I got another building. And my other building is not made by hand. It's eternal. My other building will never fade away. My other building is made by God himself. And Jesus says in John chapter 14, my other building is a mansion. And I just see my other building as just my style. Building that I couldn't afford down here. I'm sitting up tempted to put on my brand new home. The door of the church is open. When you come to Jesus, just as you are. The door is open. You can receive Jesus as your personal saint. Believing that he's the son of God. That he died for your sins. And that he rose from the dead. The door is open. Will you come? If you're here today and you don't have a church home, and you're in between churches, I recommend this one where Jesus is the center of attention. He's the main attraction. But Jesus is the captain of the ship. The door is open. The rotation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. And I hear you say, well, preacher, let me wait till I get it right. The sad summation is you'll never get it right. You got to come to Jesus and let him get it right for you. And then you can walk in him and walk with him. The door is open. If you want to receive Jesus, even as you listen to us live, you can receive him right now by just believing the story and believe that Jesus died for our sins and buried in a bottle too and rose from the dead. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. He will give you a brand new life. New life.
we serve the awesome, the amazing God, and he is God all by himself. Let me take this time to thank those who've been listening live by video on us here at the New Beginning Church. Thank you for joining us at the New Beginning Church, 4251, Sheer My Road, Houston, Texas. Thank you for being with us. And we're at the point in Houston where we're about to receive the offering. And if you want to mail in your offering, please mail it in to New Beginning Church. Make it payment to New Beginning Church, 4251. Sure, my road. Sure, my spell S C H U R M I E R S C H U R M I E R. Sure, my road. Houston, Texas seven seven zero four eight seven seven zero four eight USA. Thank you so much for joining us. Hallelujah to the Lord. It is now time for tithes and offering. Amen.